So, um, so actually, the, uh, the the approach to that the I've taken is is firmly rooted in critical digital pedagogy, and based on some of the things found in in the book. Uh, Critical towards a critical instructional design, which was uh, published by um, the Hybrid Pedagogy um, Journal. So I'm going to start from the very beginning, and I'm going to start with this idea of fear of a blank planet. Anyone know the band? No, uh, it's Porcupine Tree. So if you're a Porcupine Tree fan, then that's all right. Um, so fear of a blank planet. So my first day, I, I walk into the office. And the head of library services, uh, my boss, who's Scott at the back there, I'm just going to point, draw attention to you, Scott, um, wasn't in that day. So I sat with the head of library services, um, who I also report into, and said, what's the strategy for online? Tell me what this, the strategy is. And she said, that's why I've hired you. And that's where we started from. So actually, there was a big fear of, uh, of, of everything being blank and not really knowing things. But actually, what we find when somebody says, oh, it's a blank slate, it never is. And so um, I needed to calm down and take the advice of Taylor Swift um, and actually do some investigation. And what I found is there were pockets of practice, particularly within the learning technology development team, that were fantastic and award-winning. And some people had designed things that were winning awards. Brilliant. What a great foundation to base things on. There's a well-established taught degrees framework at uh, Edge Hill University that has been in place for quite a long time that we can look at and we can use to inform our practice. There's a well-established center for learning and teaching. Uh, some of you may have heard of Solstice and, and things like that, which we have at Edge Hill University that are fantastic vehicles for sharing teaching and learning practice and there were baseline practices that were in place and um, quite a lot of this practice and a lot of these things fed into validation processes as well and that particularly the taught degrees framework was a measure for validation processes and you know if any of you involved in learning design validation is the thing that kind of dictates what you can and can't do um, so um, I decided that we should just stick together, take Brian Ferry's um, kind of uh, approach and, and stick together on this. So what I decided to do and in partnership with, with some of the other leaders and with Scott as well, um, and I, I talked to everybody. It's a small university within our, our building, um, which is the Catalyst building. We have all the student services are in one building. So we have careers, student experience, um, international, we have um, the finance team, we have all of our frontline support, all of our uni skills support, we have all the LTD, collections, librarians, we're all in one building and it's brilliant because it means I can just walk down the stairs and go and see people and go, oh, oh all our SPLD and inclusion teams are in that, that building as well. So I decided to go and talk to everybody and I decided on an enhancement approach. So not going in and saying, no, do you know what? I don't agree with what you're doing here, but going in and enhancing everything that happens, enhance the current quality processes so that we can make sure that we're ready for delivering online. Um, I wanted to take a flexible approach. So talking to people, you find that we need to be really flexible in learning design approaches. You can't just pick something off a shelf for an institution and go, oh, this will work. Um, I'm a big fan of Carpe Diem. That was my pre previous background was working on that in Liverpool and um, a big fan of ABC as well. So those approaches are quite interesting, but they might not have suited the context uh, on what we were doing. Um, and actually, um, it's good to see Helen at the back there as well, because I, I read your paper the, the, on, the, on curriculum design very closely to see about processes as well. Um, and it was just about leveraging existing structures and processes. So not trying to reinvent the wheel with anything. And the idea was, and I'm going to sound like a massive hippie now, but the idea was to give academics a nice big hug through the validation process. Because what we find with validation, and, and probably some of you who have probably got loads more experience of, of running um, learning design teams than I have, what you've probably found is that academics get anxious about um, designing their courses. They, they do. And it's a very lonely process in a lot of places. Sometimes an academic is told, go and design that course. Or they start and, they, and somebody goes, go and design that module because you're going to deliver that in September. And we need to have processes in place to give them a hug and say, do you know what? We've got loads of people around here who can help you and support you and do that. So it involves talking. I went to everyone. This is a, a perfect circle. Nineties. I went my nineties with this one. Um, and so we um, 
I went and talked to everybody and talked to the Centre for Learning and Teaching, digital education team, which I'm part of, to people who are involved in digital education, to my team, to the SPLD team, to student inclusion, to every single team that I could talk to, I talked to, who we could get involved and developed a process that linked into the validation of programmes where we can um, support the academics through design. And it looks like this. There we go. So I'm really lucky because one of my content developers is an amazing um, graphic designer. So she she took this that was a load of shapes that I just, just thrown together in PowerPoint and, uh, and made it look pretty. So what we do is we have an academic planning committee, and that is where the business case is made for the designer programs. And then after the academic planning committee, we, we, we get triggered as a team for any online master's programs, and we then get involved. And what you'll see is that we, we get careers involved at that point. We get academic engagement, SPLD and inclusion, the program team, learning design team. There's actually more people than that that we get involved because we had um, a program design workshop which had um, 15 people in it, and two of those people were the program team. And, and that was everybody. And what, what the idea is to remove as many barriers at this point as we can. So getting quality involved. We actually found some serious issues with the structure of the module, with the quality team that we were able to fix as part of that process. So we were able to talk to quality, go, well, how can we fix this? And they helped us fix it. And we did a three hour session where we do some, we do some bits of ABC. So we use the tweet. So we asked people to tweet their module, tweet the program. What's your program? So the program team tweet what their module, the program is going to be. But one of the things that we do, it's a little bit different. Is we've got all the services to tweet how they're going to support the program. So that when we're producing validation docu documentation for faculty approval, the program leads have commitments from the departments that are going to support and help and enhance. And it's really important that we get that commitment from those departments so that we can follow that through in the validation document. So we just put a little bit tweaks, we do some rich picturing, which is from the Carpe Diem program design methodology, where we get them to think about the student at the center of it. And where's the student going to be in 10 years time from your program? We always like to place the ego, you know, imagine you're just given a keynote at the big national, you know, international conference and one person sat at the front. What do they say to you? You know, um, so once we've got through faculty approval through this, this methodology, we then move on to module design. No, we, we design the modules before we go to validation, um, because what I want the tutor to be able to do is say, oh, in module two, in semester two, um, the students are going to be doing this in week four and be able to give a comprehensive idea. So when we've got rigor behind the validation process then, so if any awkward questions come up, but also we've got the commitments from all these teams as well that we can feed through into this validation documentation. So we can say, oh, to support students with their SPLD and inclusion issues, we've got this commitment from the inclusion team on how they're gonna support online students. And again, we get careers and academic engagement. Academic engagement are librarians, subject librarians and things. Uh, SPLD and inclusion. We get the module leads then and our team. We do also involve, we have Berlin because they have faculty responsibility for, for certain areas. And then once it gets validated, we then go to our iterative design and development phase, which is based on a SAM model by a, a chap called Michael Allen, uh, which is successive approximations model. And this is how we, we then prepare for delivery of the, of the module. So we'll work then with the content development of the course and program. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what we do. That's, that's a process for you because everybody loves a process, don't they? Uh, and, and loves a very nice, neat process diagram as well to do it. So I've taken this everywhere and it's been approved. One of the things now as well, if, if anything comes through APC um, as an online program, it can't go here unless they've engaged with us. So it can't go to validation unless they've engaged with our team. Um, and that's been built into the process now through the quality team. So they have to engage with our team, otherwise they can't be validated. Um, there's new paperwork, because everyone loves paperwork as well. So I promised in the abstract of this that I was going to talk about the toolbox of approaches as well. I think this is Ian Pace, former, former Black. Uh, Deep Purple singer released an album called Toolbox uh, in the 80s. Uh, and uh, we use a blend of approaches. 
not one size fits all. And and actually, I have a big believe in, in, in things like signature pedagogies. I used to work with uh, Tunde Varga Atkins, who wrote some great papers on, on signature pedagogies, in that the approach that you take with a programme has to be bespoke to that programme. You can't say, oh, we're just going to use ABC and Carpe, we're just going to Carpe DM it because it might not work. So case in point, we've just done a, um, we're just working on teacher training mentors and developing training for them, online training for them. And we've had to take a totally different approach because the requirements on those people is very different to the requirements on students. So we've used um, uh, action mapping, which is something by a lady called Kathy Moore that I'm very passionate about as well. It's entirely flexible. So we're very open and flexible about what we do. Um, it responds to the program tutoring student needs. So uh, we do involve students. And oh, I forgot to explain on the diagram that we have student voice and, and our Centre for Learning and Teaching involvement that bound both of those things on the top and bottom. So we do include students in the program design and module design workshops as well. And we invite the, the uh, program reps to those. And they're brilliant. Um, we use elements of universal design for learning. That's an invisible thing that we put in as part of our design, our actual design development, where we will work to ensure that language is simple, that there are multiple means of representation, that there is sufficient rigor so that we can scaffold um, students through. I think a lot of people misjudge UDL. It's, you can actually scaffold students through UDL because it actually is supposed to make those students independent and make them um, approach things with a bit more rigor. Uh, we use elements of ABC, some small elements just to prepare. And then we use elements of Carpe DM. So we do use activities then to structure activity based on the outputs. What we found is that there's, I'll, I'll use this quote, I know I'm being streamed and recorded. Um, I read in validation document, um, that um, it said, I won't identify the people, so that's okay. Uh, we are de facto experts in online learning because of the pandemic. And that was in a validation document that I read. Um, and so actually ABC is very useful for talking about equivalents and things like that. So we use the, um, the ABC cards, which we've slightly tweaked a bit. And then we've mapped the ABC cards onto our own technology um, that we have in the university so that we can have conversations about how they might replace some of the face-to-face -face activity that they enjoy with digital learning uh, as well. It's rooted in our taught degrees framework. So we, we actually mapped all of the ABC activity, all the Carpe Diem activity, any other activity onto our taught degrees. I should have put the taught degrees framework up for you so you know what it looks like. Um, I'm just presuming people know, I, I forgot to put that on there, but it starts with why this, why this, why this degree. And, uh, and then there's certain things that the tutors have to consider. And that actually forms the structure for the validation documentation. And actually, it's just about it's about what we do as technologists, as, as experts in learning design, which is about bringing people together to solve problems. Uh, my favorite quote, it's one that uh, Mark Schofield, our Dean for Teaching and Learning, um, used about uh, the Solstice Conference. And he quoted somebody else, so I don't know what it was. I don't know who he quoted, but he said, it's all about smart people coming together and then leaving a little bit smarter. Um, and I, I really like that analogy of, 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 of using that in workshops. Um, so what are we doing in the future? So a film for the future, I'm a big fan of the Scottish band Idlewild. Um, there's a current review of baseline approaches. We're doing a big um, developmental inquiry. As a, as a department, as a, as a university, into baseline approaches um, and looking at how we can use the techniques we're doing. So part one strand of that is learning design and looking at things like that. And some of the big learning design challenges, um, anyone involved in non-modular? I, I actually want to see a show of hands so I can grab you and, and talk to you. Because actually non-modular courses are a really unique learning design problem that we have. So when you have medical degrees and... Um, physicians associate programs, some nursing programs, or every single VLE and every single system in the university is set up for three-year undergraduate. But actually, we need to be able to solve that problem of, 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 um, of non-modular. So we're going to be looking at non-modular as well and hopefully producing some output on, on that. Um, we're looking at systems for online CPD delivery. It's actually the project that I'm in the middle of launching at the moment and wrestling with um, IT services to get some domains. I sent emails yesterday, so... I'm not really wrestling with them, um, but um, to, to look at how we can offer online CPD. So we're looking at implementing TDM by Blackboard. 
um, which some of you may be aware of and have used. Um, we're launching our first fully online program this month. Uh, I say program, it's three. Uh, it's three stra strands of the education masters. Um, and we have students that have recruited onto that. And so we've used this technique with that, with that team. Uh, they've been very happy with it. So happy that they fed back to one of the pro vice chancellors that they were really enjoying going through the process, which made me go, ooh, um, which was quite nice. And we do have another nine programs in the pipeline, um, varying start dates. And we're, we're applying some of these principles with them. Some have already been validated. So we're just supporting to strengthen the, the delivery and, and things like that. And oh, do you know what? I finished really early, which is good because I speak a little bit fast. So I've got 10 minutes left. Is, is that, have I only spoken for 10 minutes? Oh no, I've spoken for 20. So, oh, I can take questions. That's the thing. I can, I can, I, I remember 20 minutes and then questions. So does anyone have any questions? I'm, I'm more than happy to, to take any questions that you have on what we're doing. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, our, our best example of that is program design. Um, so we had a the student rep for for the program there, and she was amazing. Um, what we do so again rooted in critical pedagogy, the program design workshop starts without anybody introducing themselves. So we don't. Um, we give them sticky name badges and ask them to take any lanyards off that don't have job titles on because we think it could be intimidating for people to go in and see somebody with a professor on their thing and they might not want to talk to them because they've got professor or doctor in their title. So we just remove all of those barriers. And sometimes we don't know. I, I don't even know what that person does, even though I've invited them. And so we just got first names. So we, we get them to talk. And that's when we, we, we do the rich diagramming in that way. So the first thing we do is rich diagramming where they have to talk to each other and, and think about where the, the student wants to be in the future. So nobody can identify usually who the student is or who the people who work for the university are and things like that. And it, it's really nice because it, it sets that tone. It's only when we've done the tweet, when they've all written their tweets, that we then get them to introduce themselves and what they do. Um, and then we go into to planning um, what we're going to do and setting out the, the module. So um, we, we involve the student in that way so the student doesn't feel intimidated. Um, and she talked about wanting a crown. She said, I want to be at the top of what I do. I want a crown. I want to be the queen of what I do. And that's that's my aspiration. That's why I'm doing this program. So we, we kind of built that into some of the phraseology that we were using, you know. And we actually bought some crown biscuits, but <laughs> then we gave her some crown chocolates and biscuits because uh, she said she wanted her crown. So it, it's really interesting from that point of view. And uh, and she was able to talk to people on a, on a really nice level as well. So, yeah, you had a question. Uh, yeah, um, just maybe I missed this, but uh, when you say learning design team, how big is the team and what kind of roles are you? Okay, so there's just three of us. So there's myself as learning design manager, and I have a senior content developer who has been at the institution for a very long time. And I can just turn to her and say, Carol, um, do you know this person? And she'll go, yes. <laughs> and I can go, fantastic. And I have Kerry, who's a content developer. Um, they're both doing kind of learning design roles, so they're not pure content development. Uh, but Kerry is a very talented graphic designer. And Carol's won um, one of the award-winning things. She's won um, exemplary course program awards from Blackboard and things like that. So using her knowledge of, of the technology to, to enhance what we do is really important. And then Kerry's just taken her qualification in Blackboard to, to support and enhance on that as well. So, oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, the kind of work that you do, you focus on program 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 development yeah and um um so we also take responsibility for online continuous professional development as well so any any activity that comes through our knowledge exchange office that is going to be delivered online we, we we run that as well but yeah we're exclusively done that carol does do some support with blackboard but just because of her experience she's on you know chairs european user groups and things like that so she's She's very involved in, in some of those things, which I think is really important for the work we're doing as well. But we also have project streams that we're working on as well that are kind of a little bit separate from our, our work, but feed into what we're doing. So I'm looking at data analytics, Carol's looking at synchronous delivery platforms. So it's we do have some little project streams that we keep 
rooting on there as well. Yes. So that's a really good question. So we've um, so it's actually based on on the face to face delivery. So actually, part of what we do when we're looking at equivalence with ABC is to look at the face to face program and say, well, how can we translate some of this to online? So where there's an established so RMA in education has been running for for decades, but probably longer than that even. I think it was originally you know we were originally a teacher training college for women. So we've we've, we've evolved in in that. So. Um, so working with the with the academic staff, they they'd revalidated the program before I started. So I went through all their validation document. They talked about signature pedagogies and that, which was brilliant. I was like magic. So they had this signature pedagogy that they'd done. So we looked at how we could enhance that signature pedagogy, and and in, implement that signature pedagogy with them. But we used ABC to look at that equivalence and, and, and what they were finding. And then we used um, we structured the activity with them using eTivities and the five stage model to get the online students doing. And what they're doing is they they're, they're going to use some of that material as well with their face to face. So we, one of the things that we're always very open about is it's their it's their content, it's their stuff. It's not us. We we may develop some of it. We may help them produce videos. We might help them to structure their VLE area. But it's their stuff. You can use that however you want. Then. Just don't change any of the graphics, otherwise we'll be getting really cross with you. <laughs> yeah. So that's again another really quick. I could say how long is a piece of string because, as we know, sometimes we will we'll do all the all the groundwork. And then one of the things that I'm, I'm big on is that the the academics own everything, so they 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 own the process, and and they they come to us. We don't chase them um, because it's their thing. So we we know that we're, we're currently in. We've got we've got one module where we know we're going to have to turn that around a lot quicker. But generally, we look at kind of um, for online CPD. I think it's at least twelve weeks, and because it, we're integrated into the validation process. It's part of that year-long validation process that we develop with. So we will develop all those things in that year alongside for, for a full program. So we wouldn't say, um, but then we'll, we'll iteratively develop using the, the SAM model. We'll iteratively develop then at the end to get the module. So we know that we don't need to, we know we don't need every module that's going to be delivered for the year ready in September. We just need the ones that are delivered in September. So we'll then iteratively develop the, the modules that are going on with the academics. So, um, but usually we'd say probably, we'd, we'd, we'd probably need a good four to six weeks to be able to, to turn around everything with them if they worked really well with us. But we know we're gonna need to do that in a couple of weeks with one or two of the modules that we're working on at the moment because of availability. Any more questions or? Uh, question. Go on. When I, I laughed out loud when you talked about the academics saying that they will, through the pandemic, be becoming an expert, is there anything that you wanted to share around that kind of experience of staff going through a very you know, tumultuous experience of having to do everything online and how they might have taken that forward in that, say, that course that they were designing? Yeah. So I think I think the online design has been as a result of some of the work over the pandemic. So it's not saying that everything that was done over the pandemic was rubbish, but what what I think as learning designers and people involved in tell what we have to realize is that people had to very quickly change their mode of teaching, which we all know. You can read all of there's so much research on it; it's insane. Um, it's almost like AI research is becoming now, which is just white noise, and so um, so people had to really quickly respond. What we're trying to do is convince people now that actually online learning can be prepared for and it needs to be prepared for and we need to put proper measures in place and plan for this and we will give you that hug that you need to do that and, and again you know it's a hippie-ish way of doing it but it is that hug it's that come on you come with us we'll, we know all the people we've got all these friends here who can help you to do this um come with us and we'll, we'll take you through it and i've got a little post-it on my uh on my on my that's from the from the academic who wrote that in their, their vast panel and we did the we did the the workshop with that team 
who'd put the de facto and he put all the stuff I learned was just amazing. So I've got that as a post-it on my desk now. So that he's he's like my inspiration now to keep going with it because actually the information from all those teams and just never underestimate bringing so many people together in a room um, and how how great that can be for ensuring that, that people, you can remove barriers. And if you can show academic colleagues that you can remove barriers for them, they trust you. And if you go, if you can go to a quality person who's in the room with you, watching it all go on, and say, "Actually, we've got a problem with the gap, with the learning hours. How can we solve this problem with the learning hours? You're the expert in how we get this through validation, so you help us with that. Actually, how can we ensure that we're, we're providing access for students? We had a really good spoon analogy from our head of. Uh, I use a different word, but I don't want to swear over the mic and over streaming. Um, but you've only got so many spoons that you have in a day. And you use those spoons, you know, some people might use, uh, I use the F word to describe this. So just, just to know that somebody got it already. <laughs> so you only have so many spoons that you have to give in a day. So say you've got five spoons to give in a day. You might use two of those to come to university. You might use two of those in your lecture. How are you going to get home? Because you've only got one spoon left and it takes you two spoons to get home. So we're thinking about those things at the point of design. How do we make these things easy and accessible for students as well? So it's just that integration of people. And yeah, I can't stress enough how important it is if you're running design to have as many people in there. Everyone thinks it's just noise, but have so many people in there that the member of staff feel supported. And, and that's that's what this, this team came out feeling. They were like, or we're ready to go. We, we, we know that we can get in touch with this person for this and this person. And they would write names down and they had all the tweets that had the commitments. And yeah, so. No worries.